Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Today, I'm super excited. I have Dr. Cameron Marshall on, who is the founder and president of Complete Concussion Management. He holds a fellowship through the Royal College of Chiropractic Sports Sciences in Canada, and Dr. Marshall's primary research and clinic practice focus, focuses on evidence-based treatment and management of concussion and post-concussion syndrome. He's the founder and current president of Complete Concussion Management, Inc., a multidisciplinary concussion care network with over 350 locations globally, and I assume that's growing, who provides standardized evidence-based concussion care. Dr. Marshall has also authored several peer-reviewed scientific articles with respect to concussion and has been a keynote speaker at several leading concussion conferences and continuing education seminars. I could go on and on about this, man. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Marshall. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Very well. Now, I thought we would start this podcast off much like Oprah did when she interviewed Lance Armstrong <laughs> with a yes or a no. Now, this is going to be yeah. tricky because I know in all science, there's a bit of black and white and mm -hmm. a bit of gray. Right. So this will be a little bit tricky. So let's go with yes or no. You can potentially go with a maybe and we can delve into it after we've gone through each question. Okay. Ready? I'm, I'm super intrigued and excited by this. All right. Has CTE been over-dramatized and over-reported by the media? Yes. Cool. But. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would do this. <laughs> I, I mean, let me, let, let, let me clarify. Can you it clarify has, what CT is first? Yeah, it's chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So it's the long-term neurodegenerative disease associated or thought to be associated with concussion. And the reason I say it's been over dramatized, it's based on what we currently know about it. So at this point in time, the media is having everyone believe that this is a foregone conclusion that concussions cause CTE. The reality is we don't know what causes CTE. So the speculation is that it's head trauma. And if it is, then, you know, I think it's important to have concern, but right now with what we know, the answer is yes, it's being over dramatized. Great answer. <laughs> Do helmets. Or I'll try to play by the rules now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. I, I think you'll get triggered by a few of these, but sure. do helmets or headgear prevent concussions? No. Don't even have to clarify that one. No. Good. Can you prevent concussions with strength neck strengthening exercises for the neck? No. Should you have longer than one week off sport after a concussion? Yes. Is tau, the protein seen in CTE, also found in 19 other tauopathies? Yes. Do you need more than one symptom to have a concussion? No. If you have had one concussion, are you more susceptible to another concussion? Hmm. <laughs> I know that's, that's really hard to answer. So far, no, but it's, it's the way in which you asked it. Should I clarify or just do you want, are you going to clarify would, these as we no, go or do you want let, to clarify? Now? Let's clarify this one now, but we can go back to some of these after we finish. Sure. We've got one more after this. Sure. Okay. So, um, okay. So the, the, the difference is in the terminology susceptibility versus increased risk. So um, susceptibility, you know, infers that the person with a concussion is somehow more vulnerable from a biologic or physiologic state. They're more, you know, susceptible, meaning that there's something that changes in their brain that makes them more likely to get a concussion again. And the reality is that has not been proven, right? We would think that if somebody had increased susceptibility, they may get concussed with less force. And actually the 
research that's been done on this has found that those with previous concussions get concussed at the same force as those with no previous concussions. So in terms of susceptibility, the answer so far seems to be no. But the research on this, if you read, like there's large scale epidemiological data, which shows that if you've had a previous concussion, then you're, you are more likely to also get subsequent concussions. But there's so many other variables that go into that picture. For example, if I'm somebody who is, you know, a, let's say a smaller athlete, if I'm somebody who plays a position that's more likely to get, you know, big, large impacts, uh, if I play a riskier style of play, if I am, let's say a fighter in hockey and I'm always getting into fights, the style of play, the body size, the, you know, all of these things matter when it comes to concussion. So if I'm a fighter, there's probably a good chance I've had a concussion, but there's also a chance if I don't change my style of play that I'm also going to get subsequent concussions. So this has been manipulated by people to believe that the person is now more susceptible to getting another concussion. No, we all, all we know is that if you had a concussion, you're actually more likely to get one in the future, but there's so many reasons why that may occur. But in terms of actual susceptibility and getting concussed with less force, the answer is no. Great answer. Great answer. I wanted to delve into each one of these and actually understand exactly your rationale. Um, but you've, you've answered that beautifully. And I've also framed these questions much like someone would ask if their child has had a concussion or they're worried about certain things. So that's why I wanted to ask them like this. So you could kind of either debunk or mm. confirm. Now, last one. If I have had three concussions in a season of sport, should I retire? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a maybe. Um, there, we, don't, we don't know. We don't really know. So it really comes down to it's a conversation with the athlete, with the parents, with the, you know, it depends on how much risk they're willing to take. I think it depends on the skill level of the athlete. Are, are they going to go professional? Are they worth, are they, are they ready to risk it all? Um, you know, I'm never going to have a, a, a conversation with somebody unless they're completely out of their mind, not able to make a rational decision for themselves the answer becomes, okay, have you successfully recovered from all three of those concussions? Were your recoveries becoming longer and longer each time you had it, or were they staying relatively the same? Did you notice that you were getting concussed with less force? Because there is a bit of susceptibility if you get concussed within a short window. So if you're getting three in a season, chance are that you could have overlapped in one of those windows and created some sort of, you know, higher vulnerability period. So it's a, that's a, that's a long conversation to have with somebody. Um, um, there's some people that will just make that delineation, three concussions in the same season, then, you know, you should really consider retirement. Um, but I think there's more that go into that decision. And I think it's a, it's a conversation to have, you know, as a care team, as well as with the athlete themselves. Completely and agree. Family. Yeah. And this is coming from someone that had to retire when it just turned 20 from concussion. And I had had about nine to 10 concussions, but I had about three in the space of about four or five months when I was 17. Mm. Um, so I wasn't adequately recovered from the first one, then the second one, and then I got a third and then finally had another one a few years later. And that was, I had to call it quits from there. So mm. I, I understand and it frustrated me that I had to retire when I did, but at the same time, I'm glad I did. This segues into this question. What is concussion and how long does it take to recover from concussion in terms of the ATP down regulation? Okay. So a concussion is a brain injury. It's also called a mild traumatic brain injury. So there's kind of three, you know, broad classifications of traumatic brain injury of mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is obviously the mildest form. Um, it, you know, may or may not have a loss of consciousness. Uh, you may or may not have a short period of time of post-traumatic amnesia where, you know, you don't really know where you are or what's happening. Um, and, you know, it's usually a, you know, a, a, based on a few signs and symptoms. So somebody gets 
you know, hit, they don't necessarily have to be hit in the head. It's an acceleration injury. So the brain inside the skull gets accelerated or decelerated at a rapid rate. So this can be either getting hit in the head. It can be a whiplash type mechanism. I've seen patients who've gotten concussed from falling on their bum too hard and they just, they jar themselves like that. Um, and basically there's 22 main symptoms that people can experience that may, you know, kind of tip you off that there's a concussion that's happened. Um, headaches, dizziness, nauseousness, fogginess, difficulty concentrating, slurred speech, blurred vision, all sorts of different things that can happen. Basically any neurological sign or symptom that happens after a significant hit should be thought of as concussion injury. The reason that those symptoms and signs appear um, seems to be not from overt damage to the brain. So far, if we look at imaging like MRI, CT scan, you don't see any, um, any signs really that the brain has undergone any sort of trauma. Um, you, you can't really, there's no, you know, focal areas of damage. We don't see these kind of, you know, dead spots that you would see on somebody with a more severe form of brain injury. So concussion, basically the brain remains intact from a structural standpoint. So most of the evidence that we have points towards it being a functional injury. And the, what happens, uh, as far as we know, is that the brain, when it gets hit, the brain tissue itself tends to stretch. And when the brain tissue stretches, each of those brain cells also stretch with it. So it's just this quick, there's kind of an elastic jelly like material. So the brain cells stretch and then they come right back together. But in the, in the process of stretching, it kind of stimulates the brain. So it undergoes this electrophysiological firing frequency. Uh, for those that understand kind of physiology, you basically get depolarization and action potentials that happen. So you get this broad scale uh, electrical storm that happens. You basically just get a millions of neurons all kind of firing simultaneously and in a haphazard way. So because you're not forming normal, you know, connections that you normally would, you're, you know, potentially seeing stars when really it's just discharge of, you know, neurons kind of in the, in the visual system. You may have, have, you know, balance impairments, but that's not necessarily due to anything other than altered information coming into your brain and nervous system that's giving you false information that's making you be off balance or sway or your eyes will be moving all over the place or you know these types of things so it's a functional injury when the brain accelerates like that and that tissue gets stimulated you have this kind of short transient impulse of neurological firing which causes all sorts of crazy symptoms and then usually after a minute or two things tend to calm down and the athlete will generally say no no i'm good i'm good i'm ready to go um, but because of all that firing, what happens on the back end of that is a, um, a mitochondrial issue. So you get an influx of calcium that comes into the cell. Calcium tends to have this high affinity for the mitochondria of the cell. So it tends to try and go there. And once it does that, it, it effectively reduces our ability to generate energy. And that's the ATP molecule. So mitochondria are kind of the lungs of our cells that they, they, they help us to process oxygen and make ATP and make energy. It's our metabolic framework. Now, if calcium gets in there and disrupts our ability to make ATP, what happens is we're burning more energy than we can actually produce. And so you get this energy deficit that starts to happen within a few minutes after the injury and it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. So anyone who's known anyone with a concussion or seen anyone or have had one yourself, you can kind of attest to the fact that you just get so fatigued afterwards. All you want to do is sleep. Um, and that's because of that drop in ATP. Now, the thing is that is not a permanent thing. And we see uh, in mice studies after about three days, it kind of turns the corner and starts to increase back up. Mice tend to hit full ATP recovery levels around day five uh, after injury. In humans, um, we keep dropping, 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 and we start to increase gradually over time um, and generally hit back up to full levels around day 30 or so. So between four and six weeks is kind of the time frame I give to, to people. Some studies have shown as long as six weeks, others, most of the studies show uh, between three and four weeks. Yeah, yeah, what I've seen you talk about before, it takes roughly 22 to 45 days to recover in terms of that ATP downregulation. And with a peak low of ATP of around, around day five to seven, is that correct? Yeah, that's kind of a, a guesstimate, yeah. um, just based on almost extrapolating from the mice data, just seeing how that curve falls. 
most of the studies that have been done have been done by this Italian group uh, and they use magnetic resonance spectroscopy to look at ATP levels. And we see the peak low in their studies at day three, but my assumption is that if mice are hitting their peak low around day three and they're fully restored by, by day five, I would assume that, because the way they study this is at day three and then not until day 15. So it probably continues downward beyond day three, but I mean, that's, that's purely just an estimate, um, you know, there, but if you think of how it's responding in mice, you can probably extrapolate that it's going to continue beyond day three and in a decline. Yep. Really well answered. This is a really interesting point that I want to go through. And this kind of goes back to one of my first questions about whether you should retire if you've had three concussions in one season. This is really important because you of, I've often heard you say the first concussion, you need to recover from that and make sure you don't get another one in that initial phase when you are recovering. Now, if you do get another concussion in that initial period where you are recovering from the ATP downregulation, if you do get a concussion then and you're not recovered, how long does it then take for you to recover that ATP downregulation? Um, so we have limited data on this. So I was saying before this, most of the studies are from this Italian group that's used magnetic resonance spectroscopy. They show ATP or N, what's called NAA, which is a correlative ATP, NAA re uh, restoring at about day 30. Um, but they, again, they only measure at 20, 21 days and it's not quite back up to normal. And then they measure again at 30 and it's back up. So somewhere in that, range of between 21 and 30 days, they're back up to normal. And like I said, some studies have shown as much as 45 days. There's the only thing we have so far is a case series of six people in that particular study that didn't want to wait because the way that was done, it was, it was done in athletes and they made them wait until day 30 before going back and participating back in sport. Well, they had six people that didn't wait the full day 30 they wanted to go back and play their sport earlier and they ended up getting subsequent concussions and so what you can see and obviously it's a very small sample there's only six people there's no controls i mean it's a hard thing to control for anyway but you have six people they've got subsequent concussions and their naa didn't normalize until between day 90 and day 120 and it seemed that the closer the two concussion injuries were to each other, the longer it took for not only their symptoms to go away after. So after the first concussion, the average symptoms, uh, the average symptom duration was about three days. And then the recovery time from an NAA position was between that 21 and 30 days, right? Now, after the second concussion, the, the, the symptoms would last as long as 50 to 60 days. And then, so not only that, you're symptomatic for now two months, and the NAA normalization, which is, if you want to think of that in ATP recovery and kind of that vulnerability period, it was, was anywhere from 90 to 120 days. So you're talking three to four weeks on the first concussion and you're talking three to four months, you know, on the second one. So, yeah. So in theory, if someone had their first concussion, they've never had one before in theory, they should have at least three to four weeks off before they get back to sport. Mm-hmm. Would you say that? Or is yeah. it, it's more nuanced than that with making sure that they A, get through the three to four weeks, but B, they don't have any you know, persistent symptoms going forward? Yeah, I think there's a combination of that. I mean, um, it's, it's tough because people always ask this question and the question is, well, why don't we just tell all athletes that if you get concussed, you're out for a month. Mm. The problem with that is that we already have a problem with reporting. We know that concussions are underreported. We know that 50% of athletes don't report when they get a concussion. And that's because they're afraid they might miss a week, right? The current kind of thought of most athletes is, oh, you get a conky, you're out for a week. Okay. But, and we still 50% are underreported. Now, if we just blanket statement made the rule, that anytime you get a concussion, you're out for a month. A, the NFL would have a very hard time succeeding as would a lot of professional sports because you'd have half your roster sitting on the sidelines for the bulk of the season. And B, I think you'd end up with a lot more under-reporting. So it's better 
And I don't know, like, I'm hoping that this is all healthcare professionals listening to this. And <laughs> because, because the way that, um, you know, like, I think from a safety perspective, it's better to have athletes have the mindset that, oh, I'll be better when I'm better. And I'm going to report this. And the sooner I do, the better, because we actually have a lot of evidence to show that when, if somebody continues to play with a concussion, they end up creating worse problems, right? You have increased glutamate release. You have increased body temperature. You have increased calcium uptake. You have increased uh, mitochondrial dysregulation. You create all sorts of problems by continuing to play with your concussion. So the sooner you report it, the better. So anything we can do to encourage athletes to do that, I think the better. Now, the way that our our clinics, um, you know, kind of talk to people about this is, you know, some people may be better sooner than others, but really in our mind, we're trying to do whatever we can to kind of get them to that point of, you know, three to four weeks on a timeline. And we also want to see full function. We're not necessarily going to come out and say that to the athlete that, Hey, you're going to be out for at least, you know, three to four weeks. We would rather say, well, you know, we'll see how long it takes. Everybody's different. You know, you'll be better when you bet when you're better. And uh, we'll just take it one day at a time. Because then it's, it's, you know, a if I just were to come out with my patient comes and sits down, I say it's gonna be three to four weeks, they're gonna go find the random GP that doesn't understand anything about concussion. And they're gonna say, sign my letter, because I have a big, you know, tournament or big game this weekend. Uh, and that GP is probably gonna sign off because they just don't have the education for the most part to realize that that's a really bad move. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very complicated question. So from a healthcare standpoint, I'm trying to get, you know, our clinics just in the mindset of like, okay, this is gonna be three to four weeks. So don't rush your follow-up visits, you know, don't try to get somebody in every single day because all of a sudden they've passed through stages and you're in a position where you have to clear somebody and it's only been 10 days. We know that's bad. We know that that's putting them in at risk for another one. That's going to be twice as bad. That's going to take them four times as long to recover. So instead of that, it's okay, we're going to tell them they're going to be better when they're better. But in the meantime, as we're working with them, we're actually, you know, just taking our time and going through the stages, right? Just kind of separating them a little bit by little bit so that we can get to that, you know, three to four week mark. So that when we're actually making a return decision, we feel pretty comfortable in making that decision, especially if the person has full function, right? Their balance is back to normal reaction times, back to normal ocular motor processing, all that stuff is bang on. And we know that kind of the metabolic side is on side with what, you know, the research says, all right, now, you know, we're making a better decision for that athlete, right? Yeah, so they, may hate, they, they may hate it in the, in the short term, but it ultimately is going to prolong their career, you know, improve their quality of life after sport, you know, do all sorts of benefits. But in the moment, you know, the, the young, you know, rugby player just wants to play. They, you know, so it's a, it's a hard thing. Yeah, exactly. It does sound like to me, and I've heard you talk about this a lot. If you get one concussion, make sure you recover from that first concussion. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing because mm -hmm. you don't want subsequent concussions in that initial period while you are recovering. And that was one of my downfalls. You know, when I was 17, I had one, had a week out because that was just what everyone did back then. It was just like, have a week out and you'll be fine. Came back the following week and then had another concussion mm -hmm. and then had to have a month out. But after listening to this and also doing a lot of research myself under sort of your guidance with your podcast and everything, it sounds like to me, even in that four week period after the second concussion, I was still nowhere near recovered. And then subsequently three months later, I had another concussion and mm -hmm. I was definitely not recovered from that after mm -hmm. the second concussion. So it makes sense that I had to retire in the end. And I'm glad that I did when I did. Um, I think that, that, you know, one of the things that, you know, I have a couple sayings that I always say, I always say, we don't have a concussion problem. We have a concussion management problem. Yes. Well done. Yeah. Right. We are, we are not, it's not necessarily having a concussion concussion, um, you know, is a treatable injury. It is a recoverable injury. Um, people that have persistent symptoms get really pissed off when I say this, but there <laughs> are, tr there are treatments for persistent concussion symptoms. There are treatments for concussion. The sooner you get good quality treatment, the better we know this. We know that the number one correlate of recovery time is how quickly you're in to see somebody with specialized training and concussion mm -hmm. and concussion rehab. So 
we know there's things you can do to, to improve the outcomes for people getting concussions. That's not necessarily the issue. That's not the thing I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about the second and third concussions when they're in that short period of time together, right? Because you have people in professional sports that are having to retire early because of concussions. Well, if we had managed those right from the start, like yeah. when the thir- when the 13 year old gets their first concussion, if we were to say, okay, this is, this is how we're going to do this. We're going to make sure that everything's good before we send you back. 90, listen to this stat, 90% of concussions that are not 90% of players that have two concussions within the same season, get that second concussion within 10 days of the first. Wow. Right? So it just tells you how vulnerable. What sports is that from? Uh, I believe that's football. I'd have to look back at it. I have the, the slide somewhere, but yeah, that was, that was the stat. 90% of players that get concussed within the same season happen. It happens within 10 days of one another. So a, <laughs> if that was our program, they wouldn't be on the field. They wouldn't even have that opportunity. Mm. Uh, but it just shows you how, how vulnerable and susceptible you are in that recovery period. Now, not only that, if you think what I told you before, that NAA normalization is now 90 to 120 days. So that's the actual recovery time point now, 90 to 120 days. So three to four months, the symptoms of that second concussion only lasted between 50 and 60 days. So if the person's relying on, oh, I'm asymptomatic, which a lot of general practitioners do, which a lot of athletes do, you know, wait till your symptoms go away. Symptoms don't mean shit. It doesn't mean anything, your symptoms. What you want to find out is when your function returns, because these people are still going to have slowed reaction time altered. This is why you need to kind of have testing involved in this. But think about that. If you're relying on symptoms, 50 to 60 days, your symptoms go away. You're going to think, man, I've already been out for two months. I'm going back. Yeah. You still have another two months where you're still within that vulnerable window of potentially getting a second concussion, right? And if, even if you think about first concussions, right? I'm talking three to four weeks before NAA normalization, but symptoms typically go away in the first seven to 10 days. So if you're relying on symptoms after a week, you're thinking you're good, but you still got three weeks of potential devastation happening after that. You know what I mean? So it just, it just comes down to um, healthcare practitioners not having a lot of, you know, education on this topic and they're making decisions that they really don't know what the implications of those decisions are. Um, and that's kind of the, the thing. Yeah, exactly. Now let's dive into this. So we mentioned the headgear and the helmets before, and this kind of frustrates me a lot when I retired back in 2008, so many people were asking me just to chuck a bit of headgear on, you'll be right. Mm. You know, you're not going to get another concussion really frustrates me that people think that a tiny bit of foam because it's in Australian rules football, a tiny bit of foam is going to make that much of a difference. Now this segues into my next question, how much force is needed for a concussion to occur versus a whiplash? And the other, this is an amazing stat. I've heard you, you said this on my other podcast, the hybrid therapist podcast, greater than 70% of all impacts in NFL is less than 30 G's. Now in context, how much force is necessary for a concussion? So the, the studies that this comes from are usually um, accelerometers placed inside helmets. So there'll be six, six accelerometers inside a helmet that'll be passing information to a computer system on the sidelines. So it's the acceleration level of the helmet. Um, But we have done studies actually in AFL uh, players and rugby players, I believe with, um, like skin based accelerometers and the, and the stats are fairly similar. So I think we can pretty, pretty confident that the numbers are decently similar. Um, but the range of concussion, and this is usually in football players, high school, college football players is between 70 and 120 G's of linear acceleration. Um, there's, you know, prevailing thought that rotational acceleration is actually more important when it comes to concussion, I kind of think of it as more of a combination. It's whichever one passes the threshold is going to be the one that gets you right. So if you have a small amount of rotational, but you also have a massive linear, well, in your case, the linear probably resulted in the concussion, but anyway, so 70 to 120 G's of acceleration to put that in context for people, um, a sneeze is about three and a half G's. So if you were to sneeze and the movement of your head would be about three and a half G's, um, uh, there were some other ones that I used to, I used to have, Oh, the average header in soccer. So if you're going to go head a soccer ball, um, and you're aware that the ball is coming, the average 
header in like girls, like middle school soccer. And also it holds pretty true for college and high school as well is between 18 and 24 G's ish. So kind of well below the threshold required for concussion, right? And soccer is one of these sports that's putting headgear on people thinking it's going to solve their concussion problem, but it's, it's not necessarily going to do that. The G forces from heading are just far too low anyway. Um, whiplash Quick, quickly is, on that quickly yes. if so if that's the case if someone heads a ball three thousand times in their career or ten thousand times in their career are you expecting them to not have any long-term deficits because of the regular heading because the amount of force per head is actually quite low yeah that's kind of so there's this constant you're getting into a concept called sub concussive impacts yep so the idea of a sub concussive impact is that you know maybe it's not enough force to cause a concussion injury where you actually have clinical signs and symptoms of a concussion but maybe those small hits over time are creating you know neurodegenerative disease or damage etc now we haven't actually been able to prove that this exists. This is kind of more of a theoretical concept or framework that, and really what this came from is the CTE mm. uh, side of things. So, you know, CTE was first attributed to concussions and, and then it was, well, you guys aren't really looking at any control brains. You know, you're only looking at people that have had multiple concussions in their career and also have signs, symptoms of dementia, and those are the brains you're looking at. So the criticism became, well, you're not looking at anybody who doesn't have a history of concussions or anything like that. So then they started getting control brains. Well, you know, I played football, but I don't have any concussion history. Um, you know, here's my brain as a control. Oh, shit, there's CTE, mm -hmm. right? So rather than saying, hmm, maybe we're missing something, maybe this isn't related to concussions, maybe this is something different. Maybe this is related to, you know, other things that are associated with tau deposition, like opioids or yes, you know, I want to talk about this steroids or alcoholism or, you know, um, all sorts of different things can cause, you know, tau deposition. So rather than kind of thinking along those lines, the researcher said, oh, it must be the sub concussive impacts, all the micro traumas happening over time have led to this neurodegeneration. So then there became this huge interest in repetitive head head hits not necessarily concussions specifically but just all the little you know hits so now you have things like hit counters you know in 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 sports where they're looking at not just the 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 actual acceleration but they're looking at just the volume of of smaller hits over time we don't really have any good evidence to suggest that sub concussive impacts do anything over time it's purely speculative um and to me, it, it, there's probably some threshold. Like if I think about this, I think that there's probably some threshold where something's going to happen, right? Like if I just tap my side of my head with my little finger like this, eventually will that cause brain damage? Probably not, right? Like you need, you need to have some level of force. Now, if I were to, you know, do this back and forth for, you know, I don't know, years, would that do anything? <laughs> Or do I need do I need more than that, right? So what's the threshold that actually becomes sufficient to create, let's say, an inflammatory response of some kind, or you know what they call this kind of mi mi microstructural, you know, kind of little damage that may happen? There's probably some sort of threshold, right? So if you look at let's say a G force spectrum, concussion yep. is happening 70 to 120 Gs, and actually if you look even beyond 120 Gs, now you're getting into subdural hematomas mm. and more severe forms of brain injury because those are also from acceleration, all right? If you actually stretch that those cells too hard, they they rip apart, and now you have physical damage. If you stretch those blood vessels too hard, they rip apart, and now you have bleeding, right? But concussion happens before that, right? So yep. when you first get that little stretch, you don't get any breaking, you just get the little stretch. Now, probably before you hit clinical symptomatology of concussion, maybe let's say between, you know, 50 and 70 Gs, maybe now you're getting into maybe like a little kind of minor inflammatory response or a, you know, maybe a little bit of a stretch, but nothing clinically perceivable that's causing microstructure, right? But then below, let's say, you know, that, that 30 Gs, you know, maybe you're not getting anything, but we don't mm. know you know, what is a subconcussive impact, right? And I read this paper and it was really interesting. They said, you know, defining something by what it is not yeah. <laughs> does not give us a good definition of what mm. it is, mm. right? Just saying that well, it's subconcussive, that just means it's a force less than concussion. Exactly. So 
what does this mean? Like if I, if I have a sneezing fit and I sneeze five times in a row, that's three and a half G's each time. Is that going to add up now to cause brain? No, it's not. Like, I just don't believe that it can. So you so, think that you think the thresholds around that 30 G's and under, you would say that it's, it's, I know it's so hard to say, but by, by the sounds of what you're saying to me right now, that repetitive headers in soccer probably aren't going to be enough force for a subconcussive knock to accumulate. I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that. Yeah, I well, just, this is such an important point because I feel like so many people think these type of things are going to cause, you know, long-term issues. And even for me, you know, when I had to retire, I thought little knocks to my head here and there were going to give me a concussion. Like if someone accidentally bumped into my head or something like that, or I hit my head on the, you know, a bench or anything, I was like, Mm -hmm. oh shit, that's giving me a concussion, but it's just not enough force, is it? I did a podcast last week and I called it, um, you, you are not that fragile Yeah. because it's just, it's you, you need in order for a concussion to happen, you need to have the brain accelerate to a sufficient enough level that you actually stretch the brain cells to a sufficient enough amount Mm. that you get, you get the membrane of the neuron to deform enough that you're going to get ion exchange because before that you just haven't done anything. Do you know what I mean? Like there's just, there's nothing that has occurred, right? Your, your brain has moved around, but it actually hasn't stretched anything to a sufficient enough degree to cause depolarization, which then becomes the concussion injury. You just, you need, you need a tremendous amount of force to get the brain to stretch to that degree. Yeah. So little bumps, things like that. Like it just, it's just not enough, not enough force. Now people will get symptom flares when this happens, right? Especially if you've had concussion before or you're dealing with persistent symptoms, somebody bumps you, you're going to get potentially a flare in symptoms. Now that's not necessarily another concussion injury. That could be a whole bunch of different things, right? We talked about whiplash being less forced. The symptoms of concussion and whiplash are identical. A lot of patients with persistent concussion symptoms actually have just ongoing whiplash issues that are causing the same symptoms. So they think it's brain, but it's actually neck related. So if you have a neck dysfunction, somebody bumps you even slightly, neck dysfunction can happen with less force. So, you know, a good sneeze can throw your neck out, right? You can sleep on your neck wrong and wake up, not be able to to move it. Right. So these little bumps may jar your neck a little bit, which may then start to make your muscles tense up around your neck, which then starts to give you headaches, starts to affect how your eyes move, starts to make you feel dizzy and off balance, which then creates, you know, anxiety. Oh crap. I've done this again. Anxiety. A lot of people hold tension in their necks. Anxiety will cause the same symptoms, confusion, fogginess. You can't think straight when you're in an anxious kind of panic state. So then all the symptoms start to manifest and you think I've damaged my brain again. But if you take a step back and understand that you actually need quite a bit of force to create that response, then it's probably something else, right? People can have visual vestibular mismatch where you know little knocks will kind of create this, this, this off kind of sensation. People can have, um, um, like in these kind of minor inflammatory responses, right. That can kind of flare up again and cause fogginess and stuff. So usually it's not another concussion. It's something else that may have happened as a result of your first concussion, but it's just something else being provoked as a result of that could be just a pure up straight up anxiety response that causes all the things to kind of come out again. Mm -hmm. Right. People with anxiety can think that they're having heart attacks. People with anxiety can think that, you know, all sorts of crazy things and the symptoms will manifest with exactly that, that. So um, anyway, that's kind of a, that was a bit of a sidebar, but. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting where you look at the amount of force needed for a whiplash versus a concussion. Cause you, what you've said previously is four and a half G's is all you need for a whiplash injury. And you've said hundred percent of all concussion patients will have a whiplash injury because a concussion's happening in that 70 to 120 G's and the whiplash is only occurring at four and a half. So of course the client, the client or the patient is going to have a whiplash injury. So hundred percent of concussion patients will have a whiplash injury, but not the other way around, like a whiplash injury in isolation won't have a concussion. Yes. Can you just delve into that a little bit? And while you're there, what do you do to delineate between the two? So um, the, uh, I'll answer the first question first. The 
concussion injury happening 70 to 120 G's. So obviously, you know, your head and your neck are connected. So anytime you're going to have 70 to 120 G's happening at the head, you're going to probably get, you know, similar type forces happening through the neck, probably just a little bit less. And, but if you flip it, you know, if you get four and a half G's to your neck, you know, you may have slightly more going on in the head, but probably not enough to cause concussion injury. Now, a really bad whiplash can now accelerate the head to 70 to 120 Gs, which could now start creating concussion injury in the brain. Um, delineating the two is very challenging because the symptoms are very similar. And um, a lot of this comes down to kind of manual examination. Does the person have, you know, radicular symptoms down the arm? Do they have, you know, muscle spasm in their neck? Can I recreate the symptoms with palpation on certain trigger points in the neck? Um, those types of things. Um, concussion is almost like a, almost a diagnosis of exclusion, but it's become the default diagnosis. In my opinion, we're probably over-diagnosing concussions, uh, but it's better to do that because, there's more liabilities for getting it wrong, right? If you're a healthcare professional and you miss the concussion and that person ends up having issues, you know, that's going to come back and bite you. So you're better off as a healthcare professional just to treat it like a concussion. Oh, you got hit. You have headaches, dizziness, um, you know, visual disturbances. I'm going to call that a concussion, you know, every single day, but I'm also going to tell the patient, we don't actually have any way of knowing if it's concussion or if it's potentially whiplash, but I'm going to treat you as if you have both. So I'm going to work on your neck. I'm going to start doing rehab exercises. I'm going to keep you doing range of motion. I'm going to work on neck proprioception, but I'm also going to look at concussion and have you start ramping up your physical exertion for blood flow. I'm going to start having you do vestibular stuff and eye tracking stuff all simultaneously. I actually gave a presentation at a conference, um, probably three or four years ago now, but I actually proposed that we do away with the term. It, it wasn't really well received. So, <laughs> but the, the, the proposal was that we really can't separate these two. We have no way of definitively diagnosing concussion. Um, the symptoms overlap. The mechanism of injury is the same between whiplash and concussion. They're both acceleration, deceleration injuries. And so I said, we should be looking at this as a craniocervical acceleration syndrome. It's a constellation of symptoms that come from acceleration of the head and neck. It, which one's causing, which one's driving, which one is, and we don't know. And so, but thinking about it globally like that, we're going to treat the head and the neck, but people aren't doing that. People are going, oh, it's a concussion, just rest. And that'll be fine. You know what the worst thing to do for a whiplash person is? tell them to rest and do nothing. Yeah, so exactly. You're, you're counterproductive here because the person that has a lot of, you know, neck injury that's driving their issues is, and is going to end up much, much worse off by you telling them to rest and do nothing. Whereas if we looked at it to say, okay, there's, there's possibly a concussion injury here. So we want you to take it easy from a cognitive standpoint for a couple of days. But I also, at the same time, want you to keep your range of motion going, make sure your neck doesn't, you know, get stiff, uh, you know, do some light stretching and, you know, come in, we'll do a little bit of light mobilization activities. We'll maybe do a little bit of acupuncture, you know, we'll get you working on neck proprioception, that type of thing to start grooving motor patterns. And we're going to treat those two in a simultaneous fashion. Yeah. And, and your outcomes are going to be, you know, much, much, much better because even if it was just a whiplash, doesn't matter. You took a conservative approach. You didn't let them go back to sport just in case. And, uh, and, and you basically rehab them. Um, and the same thing goes the other way, you know, okay. It was a concussion, but they also had a neck injury. So we treated it in the, in the right way. You're going to have way better outcomes. Yeah, for sure. Now, this is again, a really important topic. The, the topic of less than 0.01% of all hits in football result in, result in a concussion. I've heard you say that before and greater than 70% of all impacts in NFL is less than 30 G's. So by the sounds of it, concussion isn't happening that regularly. If you look at across the board for the whole season, mm -hmm. all of those hits, it's 0.01%. It's not many at all. Mm -hmm. Now this, this again, this stat comes from, this is, this is the looking at the range of concussion. So in, um, I should, I should pull it up right now. Cause I, I probably know where it is on my computer, but <laughs> 
when it, when you look at so there's been all the studies looking at um, the biomechanics like the head acceleration values they've done systematic reviews on this to kind of bring all of that research together right so in the end you know one of the bigger studies in this area um, I think they had over 1.5 million hits over the course of how many seasons over and looking at different players and with that 1.5 million hits they they had a documented like, like 300 concussions or something like that. So if you do the math on that, right, you have 1.5 million hits and these aren't just any hits. These are hits that register over 10 G's of acceleration, right? So these are, these are like hits where, you know, there's been a hit. This isn't just like, you know, like it's, it's, it's enough G's. to cause a whiplash injury, you know, like, yeah, for sure. If you think for about sure. it, you know, whiplash yeah. is four and a half and you know, yeah. it hits yeah. 10. Yeah. 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 Yep. So you have, so you have at least 10 G's, right? So 1.5 million um, hits recorded. And in the whole thing, they had, you know, 300 documented concussions. So when you actually do the math on that, it works out to, to quote 0.01% uh, of all those hits were actually resulted in concussion injury. So it, it ends up being like a small fraction of, of, you know, concussion hits. And, and that, kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? Cause you think about mm. every single play, every single play in football, you're going to have, you know, linemen all hitting each other. So you got, you know, there's 10 hits right there. And, you know, then you're going to have receivers and running backs that are running into holes and stuff, but you know, you may have one concussion uh, per game or so. Like, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but when you actually think about that, it's like, okay, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. It's really fascinating. And even if they are under reporting the concussions and it's double that, Right, you know, it and it goes be, that's to a possibility too, right? You know, it could go to 0 0.02 or 0 0.03. It's still not many, really, yeah. if you look over a whole season. So the chances of you getting a concussion playing football is actually quite small, isn't it? I, I mean, I, I think that the the thing to consider is that okay, so less less than so let's say 0.01 percent of all hits result in concussion but i think that when you play a sport like football the average number of hits in a season is between 1500 and 2000 right for for each player mm. right so if you're taking 1500 to 2000 hits i mean what's the math on that your chance of getting a concussion at some point is actually now pretty decently high yeah you know what i mean so 100 oh, percent. but at the yeah. same time if you play football you're you're not hundred percent guaranteed to get a concussion. No. Of course, it's a greater chance of getting a concussion playing football than it is golf. Yeah. But the reality is that it's probably not as high as a lot of people think. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think if you play football, you're going to get a concussion, but that doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that you definitely will. If you're playing a contact sport, yeah. obviously the chances are higher than most other right. sports, but. Right. And it depends on a lot of factors, like what position you play Exactly, it really makes a huge difference. Um, it depends on, you know, what your style of play is and, you know, how risk taking you are. Like there's some running backs that I've played with that would just, you know, they would go like, and try to bowl people over. I mean, you're putting yourself more at risk from the person who's going to try and, you know, juke and dance and, you know, get away from people trying to hit them. So it just depends on, on a lot of different factors, but, um, like for example, we did the we did the math on MMA, and it was something like um, fifteen percent of all MMA fights. So even just individual fights, fifteen percent no fifteen percent of MMA fighters. So so there's um, uh, have a chance have a chance of getting a concussion in in each fight. So there's like, if you step into the ring, you have a 15% chance that you're going to get a concussion in that particular fight. So that's a, that's a high, that's a pretty high number, right? Like you, you know, you put that over, you know, 10 fights a year um, and it's almost guaranteed, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's a lot higher than, than a sport like rugby or football, which those are the highest in terms of team sports. Um but when you actually look at the number of contacts that are happening, it, it's a low percentage that actually results in concussion. And I say that mostly just to let people realize that, you know, we are not that fragile. Like I'll have a patient that says, oh, I bumped, I bumped my head on a counter and, you know, I, I think I have a concussion. And you're like, well, mm, let's think about this, right? Like 
all these hits that are happening in football, like less than, you know, 1% of those are, are causing concussion injuries. So the fact that you bumped your head on the counter, it's a low chance that you've done enough, you know, that's a, that's a football hit. Like, you know, exactly. Got two more questions because I could talk to you about this for hours. <laughs> I think we need to do it. We need to do a part two. Cause I've got, I've literally yeah. got another 20 questions I want to ask, <laughs> but this one here, I think this is more something that people would probably want to ask you the general public. Can you speed up the recovery of the ATP down regulation, or is it something that you literally just need to give it time because you can't speed up that physiological process? So, I mean, I think there's, there's, um, when you understand the physiology of it, there's a, there's a few interesting things that could potentially be therapeutically beneficial. We don't have a ton of evidence on it. Um, but there's a couple things. So one, magnesium and calcium kind of operate on a teeter totter and, and magnesium, it works to actually block the uptake of calcium into the cell. So if you have adequate levels of magnesium prior to getting hit, you could potentially there's, there's rationale to assume that you might actually end up with a less severe concussion, or at least the symptoms may be better or the metabolic recovery may be faster because if you get less calcium coming in, you have less disruption of the mitochondria. So they're offline for a shorter period of time. Now, again, this is purely theoretical um, based on that, but magnesium is one of those things that most athletes are deficient in it. You know, we sweat it out and it's not really that high in a lot of our diets. And so it's one of those things that I recommend that any contact athlete just supplement with anyway. Um, it's very high safety profile and it's really beneficial for a lot of things like, you know, even cardiac function, sleep, um, you know, muscle fatigue, that type of stuff. I think it's, it's really good. Um, and it's cheap. Uh, and it's cheap. And yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's one that could be, you know, potentially, I don't want to say preventative, but kind of in a preventative or prophylactic thing you'd want to take just in preparation for. And um, the other one is, um, is um, creatine, because creatine essentially is, you know, exogenous ATP. It, that's why it works to help with bodybuilding and your muscles, because as you're start, you know, it gives you that extra boost of, of ATP so that you can pump out a couple extra reps when you're working out. And so there's been some studies on mice looking at creatine and accelerated recovery rates. Um, so that's one thing that could either be done prophylactically as well in athletes, where if you have, you know, higher levels of stores of, you know, ATP ready to go, it may just, you may, you know, kind of bounce back quicker, who knows, or it could be something that after injury, you might want to consider doing a bit of a loading, you know, dose for a few days to try and kind of kickstart that, that up uh, again, not really anything for human evidence. Um, and I would want to avoid that. The other thing um, I think that you could probably benefit from is just limiting inflammation because that's going to just, at least from a symptom standpoint, um, you know, like I think your metabolic health matters a lot. And I think a lot of people are metabolically unhealthy. Their mitochondria don't function as good as they should. And so trying to do things like eating healthy, avoiding, you know, refined sugars, um, processed foods and all the stuff that we, you know, all the crap we eat now, trying to really eat clean is something that we always, we always give to athletes um, after injuries to try and see if we can boost that kind of metabolic thing. There's, there's some newer evidence now on keto. Um, a lot of it is, is things you can take or do um, exercise. Now there's evidence on exercise. Again, I think that is just improving mitochondrial function, substance mm. and threshold exercise. It improves cerebral blood flow. Um, it but if you're the autonomic nervous system, there's a lot of reasons why exercise would be good too. If you're doing all these things, you're supplementing with say magnesium, creatine, you're getting your exercise in all that sort of stuff. Does that mean that the symptoms potentially are going away a little bit quicker? And in the background, it's still taking that three to four weeks at least for everything to recover in terms of that ATP down regulation. Or, or if we do supplement, or if we do supplement and do all these things and, you know, exercise, is that allowing us to recover the ATP a little bit quicker? Or is it just too hard to make that call? Yeah, it's too hard. It's too hard to make that call. I think this is all just theoretical. So I think what you'd have to do is design a really good study 
to actually look at it to see if it does actually speed, you know, recovery of ATP. It's a hard thing to study though. I mean, because mm. everyone's concussion, I mean, theoretically you could have differing severities of concussion injury, depending on how many, you know, cells are involved. You may have, you know, slightly different levels of ATP deficits. You may have, um, you know, I think it's hard to control, I think the best thing to do would probably be you'd probably start studying it in animals um, mm -hmm. and you can control the amount of force on the impact. You can, you can kind of try to make sure that everyone's starting from an equal playing field and then gradually, you know, and, and they've done this before with things like keto and they're showing that, you know, but I don't know if they're looking at necessarily ATP or if they're looking at, you know, other factors, um, you know, they'll, they'll often call the animals after and look at, um, you know, various things like tau deposition and whatever else, you know, you may see um, various compounds that are, you know, upregulated or downregulated after, after injury. So it's just, we don't, we don't know. It's purely theoretical. I think that there's, um, it's one of those things right now. It's like, we look at it like, well, it can't hurt and it may help. Okay. You know, safety profiles there, you know, we would do it. I would still, as a clinician, I'd be still holding them out. Like I'm not doing this to try and get them back to play faster. Um, I'm just doing this to help them feel better and, you know, hopefully, hopefully have a, a better chance of being outside of that window, whether they are or not, that not been proven. Yeah, really well answered. Now let's go back to neck strengthening. So you've said in my Oprah styled yes or no answers um, that neck strengthening exercises do not prevent concussion. Can we dive into that please? And why neck stiffness is what we're more after. Um, and also talking about the peak acceler acceleration of the head and the brain and all that sort of stuff far away. Okay. Um, like I said, concussion happens at 70 to 120 G's of acceleration. Now the, um, studies that have reconstructed impacts using, uh, modeling and game footage and slow motion cameras to capture when that individual hits that peak acceleration level. And there's a study that was done by Viano. Uh, in 2007 that I always quote, cause it's just a really, you know, cool study, but basically they looked at when, and it was NFL players. They looked at when do they hit peak acceleration? And they found that peak acceleration of the player getting hit, who is usually the one getting concussed is between the first six and 20 milliseconds after impact. So basically by the time they make contact, that concussions already happened, yep. right? So they're already at peak acceleration within the first six to 20 milliseconds. So there's also evidence back in the day, and this actually started in the forties where they found that neck stiffness, and this is a study they did on cats where they would try to give cats concussion injuries. Um, <laughs> and they found that if, if they stabilized the neck of the cat and didn't allow it to move at all. So if they just kind of really blocked the neck and there was no movement, they would, they would swing a pendulum down and try to give the cat, you know, a concussion and they wouldn't be able to create concussion injury, meaning they wouldn't be able to actually create something where they would have observable signs where they'd be falling over or whatever, they'd lose balance. They'd have, you know, observable signs of, of a concussion. But if they let go of that neck stiffness, where they allowed the head to move even slightly, right? Because if there's no head movement, there's no acceleration, right? Like if I hit my, if you get hit in the head and there's no movement of your head, there's no acceleration that's going to happen. So you can't injure the brain if that's how it's injured is acceleration. You know, I mean, you could make the argument there may be some fluid waves or something that may happen, but um, so anyway, head acceleration requires movement of the neck. So the idea is if we were to make a rigid neck, we could reduce acceleration of the head. So the idea became, let's have athletes strengthen their necks, okay? And they started looking at it and the hypothesis in all these early studies, and this kind of was like, you know, you know late, um, you know, like 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, 13 kind of thing when this was going on, all these studies hypothesis was that neck strength, those athletes that had higher neck strength would have less concussions. They would have lower resultant head accelerations following impacts, um, all of these things. And it was all, it didn't matter. They found that those that had the weakest necks were getting hit just as hard as those with the strongest necks. Their heads were undergoing just as much acceleration. There was no um, reduced risk of concussion in those that had the strongest necks. And I think the reason for that is because neck stiffness 
and neck strength are two different things, right? So we know that from the CAT study, we're actually looking at stiffness because we're holding the neck rigid. But neck, in order to have neck stiffness, you need to have good neck strength, but you also need to have time to contract the muscles of the neck to make the neck stiff, right? When you're playing a sport, your head is moving around, your head's on a swivel. You may be a receiver looking over your shoulder. So you're not actively contracting your neck. So the question is, how fast, if I needed to, contract my neck is, is, you know, to get that strength, to make it stiff, how much time would I need? And when you look at like EEG studies on this from, from biomechanical studies of, of, of neck muscle activation, it takes you, sorry, I'm just going to, I guess I can't mute that. Can I, anyway, my Slack is going, if you, if you have, um, um, it takes you 150 milliseconds to, to even initiate contraction or no 90 milliseconds, sorry, to even initiate contraction of the muscles of your neck voluntarily. It takes you another 150 milliseconds to even get to half of the contractile strength of those muscles. So what did I say? Concussion happens in the first six to 20 milliseconds. You, you need 300 milliseconds to even get to half of the, you know, strength of this super strong neck that you have. Mm. So because, because most concussions happen when the player that's getting hit is unaware they're about to get hit, they don't even have time to react, right? Because you basically need a half a second to get to, to use that stiff neck. And if you have half a second, my argument is you'd probably just get out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like if, if you're running and like, why would you just <laughs> You know, some people you're going to go right through it and you're going to, you're going to tighten up and you're going to stiffen and that's going to be protective for you. So I think it could be protective if you're aware the hits coming, but with most concussions happening when the person's unaware, this is why neck strength, I think doesn't hold up because neck stiffness and neck strength are two different things, right? You have to be aware. So there's actually been studies looking at like neuro, um, neuromuscular activation, like, you know, the speed at which you can contract your neck muscles actually matters more uh, than pure strength. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that type of stuff is, is interesting because it, then it kind of, it kind of shows you why that, why that might be. So athletes working on purely neck strength, you're not going to actually reduce your concussion risk at all working on maybe your vision will and they've actually done studies to show that vision training before a season is protective against concussion because now you have more game awareness you're able to see the play better you may you know be able to react that split second quicker and and avoid that hit or you know stiffen up in time so um i think there's other ways around it i just think next next strength by itself is too simplistic and it doesn't work yeah, agreed and beautifully answered. I think you're becoming more game aware and being able to get out of the road and you've always got those players in any sport that never get injured. They never get hit. <clears throat> They're so intelligent with how they play and they always just seem to never get hit. And you're like, how do they get through a whole season and a whole career never getting hit? Yeah. <clears throat> it's remarkable. Yeah. yeah. But that's and, like and maybe that's here. Yeah, exactly. And maybe that's something that we need to focus on more than focusing on the next strengthening focus on these these women and men getting better at just be, becoming better at their sport so they can get out of the way and they become better at their game sense and then potentially that is going to reduce the the potential risk of getting a concussion purely because you're just getting out of the way all the time mm -hmm. it's well, I mean, very it's very hard in Aussie rules football though and that's one thing I wanted to say was it's a 360 degree game there's people coming from all angles, much like say mm -hmm. hockey. Mm -hmm. And I, most of my concussions were all just because I didn't see them coming. Mm -hmm. So it is a little bit tricky in that regard, but when it is more of a linear sport like rugby or rugby league or something like that, well, that's a little bit more um, potentially relevant. Um, it is tricky in a game like Aussie rules. Yeah. If somebody's coming from behind you, you know, you have no, no chance. I mean, even football, you know, it's, it's, for the most part, a linear game, but you know, it, the ball, the, the player that's going to hit you is in front of you and you're looking over your shoulder to catch exactly coming from, from behind you. You just, you have no chance. You just, you're just, you're out there. Right. In, in, in hockey, we call that a suicide pass. Somebody yeah. passing up and you're looking behind you to catch that pass. That's called a suey. Like somebody's going to, you're going to get smoked coming through the middle. Right. And that's how a lot of concussions end up happening is open ice hits. Player has no, re, no, you know, awareness that the hits coming, 
um, not even thinking about it. And it's just, it's happened before they know it. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, Cam, I, I really want to do a part two with this. So we're going to have to organize that in sure. the next couple of months. I'm sure, thoroughly yeah. enjoying this, but I think uh, we'll leave it there. I've got to go. You've got to go. So have you got any final last thoughts? Um, one thing I do want to dive into next podcast is CT. There's a lot to unpack there. Have you got any last final thoughts for all the listeners out there? Out there? No, I think that, um, you know, just the the idea that if you're going to be in this space, like make sure, like, especially from a, from a, from a clinical standpoint, um, you know, I think there's, and I know that your, your podcast listeners are probably mostly physios. Like, I mean, there's a huge opportunity for physios to get involved in this space, both from a rehab perspective, but also a return to sport, you know, testing perspective. I think that's, that's kind of what CCMI does um, is provides that training and education um, and, and also the platform and tools to be able to do it. So I think that if you are a clinician in the space, then, you know, do what you can to get educated on it. If you are going to see patients with concussions, it's a really cool field. Uh, it's, you know, evolving rapidly, obviously. And the fact that there's, you know, a huge opportunities for PTs to, to kind of get involved. I think that's, that's just huge, but make sure you make sure you do your homework and find out, you know, how, how to do it. Right. Cause yeah. there's you know kind of a lot at stake if, if you don't, but um um, yeah, that's, that's all I'd say. And for those that are listening as athletes and things like that, just because I said it's a month, don't not report your injuries because yeah. I think that that's really the biggest thing. Like we know that it all comes down to recovery time. And so if you are smart about it, you can, you can actually, you know, increase your career time. You can play for longer. You can have a more successful career by, just taking these things seriously, right? It's like any injury. If you have a shoulder injury and you don't take care of it, guess what's going to be the downfall of your career? You're going to retire because of shoulder injuries or knee injuries or whatever it may be. You're going to wreck your body and not be able to play for as long. But if you just take the time now, you'll be able to do more later, right? And I think that's something is, is we have such a short-term view process a lot of times as humans. Um, and we need to be thinking more long-term. And so um, that would be my advice for the athletes. Agreed. And recover from your first concussion. I think that's a real Number huge, one rule. that's a huge takeaway. Um, now, Cam, thank you so much. You're a wealth of knowledge and let's do it again soon. Where can all the listeners find you? And also for the physios out there that want to learn more about what you do and also the courses and everything that you have, even your podcast, um, where can we find you, mate? Uh, okay. So social media um, at concussion underscore doc. Um, and that's on Instagram and Twitter, um, at complete concussions with an S complete concussions, uh, on Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter is at CCMI concussions just cause complete concussions didn't fit. Um, and if you go to complete concussions.com, you'll see kind of our clinic certification program, um, with training programs and stuff like that. Um, and you'll be able to kind of do more, more there, but, uh, podcast is ask concussion doc. Um, so you can find that on various podcast platforms, YouTube. We have we'll throw up a lot of videos on YouTube and stuff like that too. Patients and, and, uh, clinicians. So, uh, you can find me somewhere. Yeah, exactly. The, the podcast is great by the way. And also a big fan of your videos where you describe, you know, what concussion is you use a whiteboard and all that sort of stuff. It, it is yeah. very easy when you've got a whiteboard because it's a little bit easier to, for people to conceptualize when you're you know drawing yeah. things on the whiteboard. So if you're really interested um, dive into all of um, Cam's content because it is great. Um, this podcast is live on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Um, thanks again, Cam. Let's do it again soon. And as usual, guys, stay strong.